Hi, Nancy. Hi, Shane. It's good to see you. Yes, in person. I know. That's the uh, the perks of us living close to each other and me having a studio in the yes. basement. It's great. And it's a uh, it's a new day for Third Pod as well. Uh, so we've been on a bit of a hiatus for the past bit in preparation for we're going weekly. Wow, that's exciting. It is very exciting. A little little daunting, but but it'll be good. It'll be good. And we get to see each other. Try to convince yourself. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it'd be fun. So so this week, actually, we have a little preview of things to come. Starting in April, we're going to be running back-to-back six-part miniseries on different themes. So some things to look forward to are we're going to be doing stories about extinctions. Uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> Start right there with the. It was. Well, yeah. That's not the first one. Uh, this is just some of the things we're doing. We're going to be doing stories from NASA. So talking to a lot of NASA scientists. And actually, what we are starting with is we're going to be pulling back the curtain to hear about who is science, right? I think oftentimes when folks think of science and scientists, they think of Einstein or now Fauci or something like that, and that's fine. Like they are scientists, but there's. There's more than that, and there's more to people who actually do science and do research. So over six weeks, we're going to hear from a bunch of different folks, from field biologists to policy wonks to psychomers and more. We're calling this series True Stories. Our interviewer was Ashley Hamer. Great. Let's hear it. Science is fascinating. But don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompy. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. I am Dr. David Schiffman. I am a marine conservation biologist, and I'm a faculty research associate at Arizona State University. What are some of your, like, least favorite misperceptions about sharks? The classic one is that the only good shark is a dead shark, and sharks are bloodthirsty killers, and if you dip your toe in a bathtub, a shark's going to eat your whole family. And that's not true, and we've known that's not true forever. But the pendulum has sort of swung too far in the other direction recently, is now you have scuba divers who are saying that sharks are cute, adorable, innocent puppy dogs, and they just need love and hugs and kisses. And people do hug and kiss wild, free-swimming sharks. Don't do that. Like, these are not the only two options here, right? Like, right. It's a, like, you wouldn't, if you were hiking and you saw a bear, you wouldn't try to ride it, but people do it with sharks all the time. And that, and then other people say they're heroes. And it's nonsense. Right, gotta just <laughs> treat them with respect, yeah. but not, it's yeah. It's a wild so- animal. My name is Gina Zwicky, and I'm currently a graduate research assistant at the University of New Orleans. Catching a knolls is always a bit of a fraught task because they're really small and they're really fast. So there are a couple ways you can go about it. Some people are really, really good with just the grabby hands method and kind of as gently as possible reaching out and snapping them up. But many people also use catch poles, which have a little bit of string loop at the end, which is really funny because I, I can never understand how the anoles don't see you putting this little string around their neck. And it looks like a fishing pole, so I'll be standing nine feet away with just an extended pole with a little piece of string on the end. And the lizard sits there like, all right, this is cool. No problem. And then you snap the pole, catch the lizard, take what samples you need and let them on their way. But they never see it coming. I don't get it. Wow, that's amazing. You're you're lassoing lizards, basically. I'm Tanya Harrison, and I am the Director of Strategic Science Initiatives at Planet Labs. What is it that drew you to science in the first place? There was sort of a coming together of a bunch of things around the age of five that I think were all super influential. One was growing up watching a lot of Star Trek. Another was the Magic School Bus Lost in the Solar System book. I actually have the copy from when I was like four or five years old on my bookshelf behind me still. And randomly, the movie Big Bird in Japan, which does not sound like it would be space-related at first, but 
In the movie, Big Bird ends up meeting Kaguya Heimei, who is the mythological princess of the moon in Japan. There's actually a Kaguya mission named after this, this princess that the Japanese space station she sent to the moon. And for some reason, that caused me to just go out every night and I would stare at the moon and stare at the stars. The, it just kind of evolved from there. And then I focused in on Mars specifically when the Pathfinder mission landed and the little Sojourner rover drove out onto the surface of Mars. And I thought... That's that's so cool. I can't believe that we're driving robots on another planet. Like, I want to work on that. And so I became super focused. I was like, I got to figure out what I got to do to work on these rovers. My name is Jada Elcock. I am currently a first year PhD student at the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution joint program. When I was out in the canyons, tagging whale sharks, you can't obviously pull them onto the boat because half the time they're bigger than the boat because they're the largest fish on the entire planet. So what you have to do is you have to get in the water with them or tag them somehow from the side of the boat. But the way we went about it is we got in the water with them and we put a tag on them like by hand. So I got to put a tag on one of these animals and it was the coolest thing ever. I was in the water with this likely 35 foot shark that is a filter feeder and I know is harmless and wants nothing to do with me and is simply existing in its space and is like, that's a speck over there. And I'm sitting here like, this is the largest animal I will likely ever see in my entire life. And it's gorgeous. Like all these, these spot patterns are so pretty. Their spot patterns are unique for each individual as unique as a human fingerprint. So I was like, I could take a picture of this and then in 10 years, if someone takes a picture of this animal again, I can just tell you what animal that is. Like I have footage of it. Like that's the coolest thing ever. And to just be existing in the water with this gigantic shark that I never thought that I would ever encounter in my entire life because I grew up in the desert. I was like, I feel so like at peace and connected with nature. Cause I feel like we, as people, feel so disconnected from nature so often because we're like online all the time and we never go outside. My name is Pacifica Summers. I am a microbial ecologist at the University of Colorado Boulder. I have been to Antarctica three times, always for the summer research seasons. And if you go early in the season or leave late in the season, the ice runways that you land on when you get to McMurdo Station on the coast of Antarctica are solid enough that they can fly the C-17 jets. And those are reasonably comfortable. They're reasonably large. They take about five hours to get there. If you are going when it's a little bit warmer in December near the summer solstice, those ice runways cannot support the C-17. Then they, they need to fly you on a C-150, the Hercules propeller plate. So it takes more like eight hours and you are crammed in there shoulder to shoulder and with your knees in or locking with the people across from you, sitting on these mesh, like mesh kind of webbing seats. The pro tip is to put your big red parka behind you to create some kind of a, a seat back and a little bit more comfortable situation in there. And the bathroom is a bucket behind a curtain. So you climb over everybody's knees to the end of the row and you step behind the curtain. And I was aware that it was a bucket behind a curtain, but what I didn't expect was that <laughs> there's not like a lot of floor space around that to really get situated if you're a lady over that bucket. So there's like a ladder that's like on its side. So I was like kind of standing on luggage and ladder pieces balancing over <laughs> this bucket. <laughs> And you're you're on this propeller plane for like an eight hour flight plus or minus time on the ground on either side. So um, that was an experience. <laughs> My name is Emily Williams and I'm currently a PhD student at Georgetown University studying the migration of American robins. We had all of this food and equipment stored in the rafters of this wooden platform. So the platform itself, our tents were on, but then we had an overhang and then we stored a lot of our stuff in this overhang. It was a constant battle with capuchins, which are incredibly smart from keeping them from getting into our stuff. 
We also had this wooden case that we kept eggs, which, you know, a lot of people think eggs should be refrigerated, but they don't need to be refrigerated. Uh, we had eggs and this butter and this type of bread in there. And we actually would have to keep it locked. So not just like, you know, this wooden case had a lid. And if you close the lid, that wasn't enough to keep the capuchins out. Like, they just open the lid, go in there, and steal your food. I don't know about y'all, but I am super excited for our first season in our weekly series, and I hope you all too. Thanks to Ashley Hamer for conducting the interview, NASA for sponsoring the series, and Colin Warren for audio engineering. We would love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review our podcast, and you can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next week.